uh, my extreme gratitude uh, to the Schorbeck family, members of its scientific board, uh, the Karolinska Institute for this great honor and the pleasure of sharing this award uh, with my friends and colleagues, and in particular, my longtime friend and collaborator, Chen Su. I will present you uh, the APL story, perhaps with a slightly different facet uh, from the one uh, that uh, Anne de Jean showed. Tremendous progress has been made in our understanding of cancer biology. Yet, surprisingly, the most efficient treatments to date uh, were often found by chance through progressive and empirical clinical uh, trials through trial and error procedures, as exemplified very well by childhood leukemia. And actually, reviewing the literature and discussing it with colleagues recently, the actual basis for biological basis for response to therapy remains unknown in most cases. Very recently, in particular on the base of uh, Tony Hunter's work and others, many targeted therapies uh, have been developed. Many have shown survival benefit, but at present they almost never cure the disease, at least on their own. And I hope that I, my talk will convince you uh, that APL has now become a hallmark of precision medicine and perhaps the sole example of rapid and definitive cancer cure by targeted therapies. So, uh, as you heard from Anne de Jean, uh, APL was described in 1957, uh, actually by a Norwegian uh, rather than Swedish uh, clinician, who described it as the most vicious of all uh, acute leukemias. Janet Rowley uh, described uh, a recurrent uh, chromosome translocation, 1517, which is found in virtually all patients just a few years later. And critically, uh, Ted Breitman at the NIH uh, discovered that a hormone, retinoic acid, could trigger ex vivo differentiation of primary APL blasts. This was, of course, immediately followed by attempts to convert this into the clinic, but using synthetic retinoids, and these synthetic retinoids failed to have clinical activity. And it's in 1998 uh, that Wang Zhenghe, uh, shown here in Laurent de Gauss while he was visit visiting his lab in Shanghai, succeeded in obtaining complete remissions in virtually all APL patients using the natural rather than the synthetic derivatives. Uh, and this opened the field of differentiation therapy. Uh, it should be stressed that these complete responses were unfortunately most often short-lived and that most patients did relapse after a couple of months or a couple of years. And the identification of the retinoic acid receptor alpha uh, by Pierre Chambon and the realization by Laurent de Gauss that it stands in the, mega, in the mega base vicinity of the breakpoint of this retinoic acid sensitive disease allowed the demonstration uh, in Saint Louis Hospital in collaboration with the clinical team that RER alpha is rearranged in uh, many APLs. This allowed, as, you, as you've heard, uh, and Jean and I to perform the molecular cloning of the 1517 translocation, which, as you've heard, induced a retinoic acid receptor alpha gene and a partner gene that we named PML. Critically, uh, PML RER is really the key driver of APL. Its expression suffice uh, to uh, induce uh, transformation ex vivo or in vivo, and evidently retinoic acid binds PML RER, providing the first example of leukemia-targeted therapy, even this, if this arguably was realized a posteriori after the clinical efficacy of uh, arsenic was demonstrated. So uh, this allowed Anne and I to show that PMLRER behaves as a transcriptional repressor. Since uh, retinoic acid signaling was implicated in myeloid differentiation, inhibition of retinoic acid signaling by PML RER expression was therefore responsible for the differentiation block, and treatment with retinoic acid would induce the reactivation of target genes driving differentiation in a remarkable model of transcription based therapy driving differentiation. Note in passing that this is exactly the mirror image of treatment of breast cancer with anti estrogens, because in breast cancer, at least in estrogen-positive breast cancers, uh, you have hyperactivated estrogen signaling, which is shut off using anti-estrogens, anti and it's exactly the same uh, for prostate cancer. 
So this was the basis. It went very quickly to the textbooks uh, because it was simple and made a lot of sense. Then there was a revolution, another Chinese revolution, that really started uh, with the clinical demonstration of the efficacy of arsenic trioxide. And in 1995, on the occasion of my third uh, scientific visit to Shanghai, I met uh, Chen Su, whom I had met already in Saint Louis uh, in uh, 1988 or 89, uh, who told me about his unpublished studies on the arsenic efficacy uh, in this disease. And we immediately decided to co collaborate on this issue and have continued uh, in the past the next years. So how did this uh, matter? Uh, well, remarkably, it seems, at least at first glance, that retinoic acid and arsenic do exactly the same. They induce 95% complete remission, and they induce differentiation in patients, and actually very eminent cytogen cy cytologists, such as Marie-Thérèse Daniel, whom uh, Chen, uh, Chen Su knows very well, said she, was, she could not distinguish retinoic acid from arsenic-treated patients based on the bone marrow samples. So we have Sorry, we have differentiation in vivo, but there is a very large difference. I told you that retinoic acid does not cure, but arsenic cures, and it can cure in up to 70% 70 70 of the patients definitely cure single-agent therapy. So arsenic emerged as probably the most efficient anti-leukemia or any anti-cancer drug ever, uh, ever discovered. And uh, I was particularly excited when as soon as I came back to Paris from this visit, uh, we uh, this, the, uh, this found that arsenic has no effect whatsoever on retinoic acid signaling, and because it was, there was no effect on retinoic acid signaling, this was clearly uh, mechanistically incompatible with the transcriptional activation model. So, uh, we uh, started uh, by discovering uh, that uh, that PML is an exquisitely arsenic-sensitive protein. You've heard uh, from, from the nuclear bodies uh, from uh, Anne de Jean. You can see here this dual localization where the protein is associated in bodies and also has a diffuse nuclear localization. And this is rapidly, in an hour, shifted in a, complete in a complete aggregation of the protein. So we have a targeting from the diffuse nuclear form of the protein towards these nuclear bodies. This targeting is accompanied by a change in the solubility of the protein, which moves from the nucleoplasm uh, towards uh, the, the nuclear matrix uh, and becomes modified uh, by something we did not know at the time and which was later shown uh, by Anne to be sumo. Importantly, uh, this also is accompanied by the degradation uh, of PML. So, in remarkable uh, similarity to retinoic acid, which targets the retinoic acid part of the fusion, arsenic targets the normal PML protein and uh, changes its nuclear localization, changes its bi biochemical feature, and uh, finally uh, degrades it. So, uh, we recently uh, extended this by demonstrating that actually the professional function of PML is to be a sensor for oxidative stress, and oxidative stress, a uh, ROS, which can be in fact mimicked by arsenic, control the target, the, the, the distribution between a diffuse nuclear form and a polymerized aggregated form, which in fact creates this shell of PML uh, nuclear bodies. So uh, we got very interested into uh, PML, uh, the relationship between PML and arsenic, and even, in fact, more interested because we had discovered, uh, as the first studies we, we did in my lab in Saint Louis, that PML act is aggregated onto these shell-like structures, creating these dots that you can see here, and that this normal organization is disrupted by PML RER expression, as you can see here. And the fact that arsenic targets PML and PML RER allows it ex vivo uh, to reform very rapidly, literally in a couple of hours, reform these PML nuclear bodies. Importantly, uh, work, subsequent work showed uh, that PML is a scaffolding shell that recruits a very large number of partner proteins controlling their, their post-translational modification. And in particular, it was shown uh, by the group of Pellici that it controls P53, E2F, and that it's a key senescence gene. 
The fact that PML, RBR expression, disrupts PML nuclear bodies was shown by Pier Giuseppe Pellici to disrupt uh, P53 signaling and therefore to enforce apoptosis resistance, which could contribute uh, to leukemia development. Strikingly, retinoic acid does exactly the same. And these are patients uh, treated in, in St. Louis in 93, historical slide, uh, showing that this deorganization of nuclear bodies in vivo, in patients that you can see here, is immediately corrected by retinoic acid while those cells are still blasts. And those cells which are still blasts have reformed their nuclear bodies, implying, uh, suggesting at least, that there was a, in, in these in vivo studies a key role of nuclear body reformation in therapy response. So uh, this suggested that there would be a, a contribution of uh, PML nuclear bodies to the pathogenesis of the disease. It did not explain the mechanism. And uh, understanding the mechanism came uh, with a realization uh, together with Chun Zhu and Chen Su's lab that actually retinoic acid and arsenic uh, degrade the PML RER alpha protein. As you can see here, retinoic acid also uh, degrading the normal retinoic acid receptor alpha, while arsenic does not. And so we made uh, the bet which I can tell you was extremely bold at the time, and this is a review taken from a review that we published uh, with, with Chen Su, we made the bet that PML RER degradation, which was the only property shared by retinoic acid and by arsenic, was likely to be more important uh, than transcriptional activation. So because we were convinced uh, that degradation was indeed important, uh, my lab invested uh, lots of efforts in trying to understand the protein degradation pathway. So it was relatively simple for retinoic acid. Retinoic acid binds to the hormone binding pocket of the RER moiety of PML RER, induces a conformational change, and this conformational change uh, triggers the recruitment of the proteasome and proteasome-mediated uh, degradation. So this, in fact, happens to be a general feedback mechanism on nuclear receptor signaling, which is cons conserved for all nuclear receptors. So this was well accepted by the community. Uh, the other part was much more complicated. It took about 10 years, uh, starting uh, from the first observation in 97, 10 years to understand this, and this was really the work of Valérie Lallemand, a, a PhD and then staff, uh, staff scientist uh, in the lab, uh, who realized over the years uh, that arsenic uh, binds to a specific uh, pocket in uh, the one of the B boxes of PML RER, uh, findings that were also uh, obtained uh, independently by, by Chen Su's lab. And this induces the oxidation of PML, and this conjugation of oxidation and direct binding is the basis for nuclear body aggregation. This nuclear body aggregation triggers, the con the, the, the triggers conjugation by SUMO, and uh, SUMO conjugation then recruits an RNF4-dependent polyubiquitination, which will recruit the proteasome and induce uh, degradation. So why was that complicated to, to accept by the community? Is that at those, in those days, uh, when we started those studies, uh, SUMO was believed to antagonize the ubiquitination and was therefore not seen as a signal for degradation, but as a signal for stability. And so coming with the first example of SUMO-initiated uh, degradation, of course, was very hard, and we, it's only with the discovery of RNF4 and, and this sumo-dependent uh, ubiquitination uh, that this new protein uh, degradation pathway uh, was accepted uh, by, by, by the scientific community. And now, as, as Anne has mentioned, uh, there are dozens and dozens of proteins which have been shown to be degraded uh, by this, um, this pathway. So the community was extremely split, and the, 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 the APL community and the scientific community at large was split between the transcriptional activation model and the degradation model. And uh, it's uh, only uh, going to mice uh, that we were able to clarify, clarify these issues uh, using animal models that had been generated uh, and used by many labs, including mine, that of Pierre Paolo Pandolfi, and that of Scott Cogan. So exploring a variety of these models, uh, Julien Ablin, who is a brilliant uh, PhD student in the lab, realized uh, that transcriptional activation or reacti reactivation underlies differentiation, where retinoic acid or arsenic 
uh, uh, dependent PML RER degradation allowed a reformation of PML nuclear bodies, the activation of P53, and the loss of self renewal. And so, one illustration uh, of this is uh, by looking at uh, APL cells in animal models, so we're in an in vivo setting, where you can see that we have retinoic acid-induced stabilization of P53. P53, of course, is a universal tumor suppressor, very well known and well studied at the Karolinska Institute. This effect is completely PML dependent, and it's even more striking uh, with arsenic. You see that you have a time-dependent massive stabilization of arsenic, which is only observed in the PML plus background, nothing in the PML null background. And indeed, in APL mouse models, uh, Julien was able to show that PML and P53 are both absolutely required for the loss of clonogenic activity, but not uh, for the differentiation. So, uh, how, how does PML activate P53 is not entirely understood. However, uh, many groups uh, have shown that P53 concentrates within PML nuclear bodies with, together with virtually all of its post-translational modifiers. And our view is that PML nuclear body constitute a catalytic chamber where PML, P53, will undergo post-translational modifications that will control its activity before it exits those nuclear bodies and reaches uh, the chromatin where it will activate specific target genes. And so PML can be really seen as an oxidative oxidation, oxidative stress sensitive uh, catalytic chamber whose aggregation will turn on P53 signaling and indeed in uh, results that were just published last year in GXMED, we were able to show uh, that PML is absolutely essential for oxidative stress driven P53 activation in normal tissue, no longer in the context of cancer but in normal tissues. So, uh, I didn't tell you but uh, I'm a doctor by training, and uh, therefore I'm interested in therapy optimization. And it was key to try to understand uh, whether we could, uh, in fact, uh, enhance what, what, whether there would be synergy or antagonism. And looking at differentiation as an endpoint, uh, it was very clear for, this is just one of the papers, but there were many of them, showing that the combination of retinoic acid and arsenic was antagonistic, taking differentiation as an endpoint. However, when you go to the mice models, it's completely different. You have a dramatic synergy of the two, uh, as you can see here, uh, was almost complete elimination of the disease uh, after just a week of treatment. And when you look at survival, which is, of course, much more important, uh, we have no, no, no cure with retinoic acid or arsenic, but cure of all the animals treated with the combination. And I should say that similar results were obtained independently uh, by Pierre Paolo Pandolfi and Chen Su's group in, in Shanghai. This uh, led to the clinical trials that, uh, that uh, Chen Su will, will talk uh, to you about that showed that similar results could be achieved in uh, other uh, conditions. So uh, this new model, um, this in, sorry, uh, in this new model, PML plays an essential role. And so there was two views uh, that you could have of this to interpret the synergy. The first uh, is that there would be synergistic degradation. And, and, and Chen Zhu and I wrote a number of reviews actually that the, uh, stating that the basis for synergy would be enhanced degradation, and you have enhanced degradation between, because the two degrons are different, so using two different biochemical degrons, the protein is, is of course, de degraded much quickly. However, the fact that I showed to you that PML is the actual effector of disease cure and that arsenic targets PML argued that you could also have a direct effect of arsenic on the normal PML allele, which is the curative mechanism in this condition. And indeed, as you can see, the reformation of PML nuclear bodies, this is only six hours in vivo in mouse models, is much better uh, with the combination of the two, uh, again, in striking parallelism uh, with the uh, curative uh, activity. 
So this proposal that arsenic actually targets a normal allele of PML to eradicate the disease was supported by the analysis of historical therapy-resistant patients that, were, that was done in a number of places in the world. So retinoic acid resistance, as expected, was mapped to mutation in the ligand-binding domain of the RER alpha moiety of PML RER. Arsenic resistance uh, was mapped to highly clustered mutation around the uh, arsenic binding site in the B2 box uh, that Chen Su's group and my group had identified. So this, by the way, was a very nice confirmation that this was indeed the arsenic binding site because it was mutated in patients. But most remarkably, uh, we and subsequently others described the same hotspot mutation uh, on, on this alanine residue, but on, the, on the, the arsenic binding site of the normal PML allele. And of course, this genetically establishes that arsenic targets the normal PML allele also uh, to uh, cure the disease. And so this leads to a refined model uh, wherein we have retinoic acid and arsenic both triggering PML RER degradation and, and allowing passive nuclear body reformation, but at the same time, arsenic will target normal PML to enforce maximal uh, female nuclear body reformation, as you've seen, P53 activation, driving the cure of APL. And this, of course, explains why you've seen that the stabilization of P53, the universal tumor suppressor, was much higher in terms of amplitude when triggered uh, by arsenic than by retinoic acid. And this, of course, explains the clinical potency of arsenic, which alone, again, can cure the disease. So what are the lessons taught by APL? Well, I think probably clinically the most important one is that the retinoic acid arsenic combination is a curative targeted therapy in virtually all patients, as you'll hear uh, from uh, Chen Su's talk. Uh, this may be due to some APL specificities. Uh, APL is a quasi-monogenic condition. We now have done uh, whole exome sequencing of a number of APL patients and actually found some patients for whom there was only the PML RER translocation and absolutely nothing else, making it a, a purely monogenic disease. And also, the genome is very stable so that you do not have a selection of, uh, of mutation that would impair therapy response. Another, option, another important conclusion is that we have drug-induced protein degradation rather than a transcriptional activation underlying cure. And we have a key role of this axis, this ROS-PML P53 axis, uh, in complete disease eradication. So just to, to move on uh, to, our current, uh, to our current interest, and we would like to use now PML nuclear bodies uh, as drug targets. And this can be done uh, because interferons actually massively uh, upregulate transcription of the PML gene, uh, as shown by Anne Deschamps' lab and my lab. Also, interferon massively stabilize uh, the, sumo, uh, the SUMO1 or SUMO2, so that with interferon impregnation, you have maximal uh, levels of these two uh, peptides. And by combining interferon with arsenic, you will induce the polymer polymerization, formation of this shell, uh, recruitment of UBC9 and partners, and you will drive partner simulation and partner degradation. Uh, you can see this illustrated in vivo with mouse livers, and you just have one small nuclear body per cell. If you have treatment with interferon and arsenic, you have massive formation of enormous PML nuclear bodies that would allow uh, the, uh, the, the driving of these biochemical changes. And so what are the conditions that we're interested in at the moment? Well, these are conditions of diseases which are known to be sensitive to interferon and may involve uh, PML-driven senescence or proteolysis. One example of that is adult T-cell leukemia, uh, where the tax viral protein was shown to be degraded by interferon and arsenic in a PML-dependent manner. Another uh, is a JAK2 mutant myeloproliferative neoplasm, which are very well known to be clinically sensitive to interferon, and we're now investigating the possibility uh, that this response is at least in part PML dependent. And also neurodegenerative diseases caused by misfolded protein have been shown to be aggravated uh, by PML inactivation in the mouse. 
And so, of course, one of the predictions of this model is that these interferon effects would then be enhanced by arsenic or other PML modulators, and we actually have evidence that this is indeed the case uh, for adult T-cell leukemia. And so after, after for 30 years, uh, driving uh, empirical treatments into rationalized one, uh, we are now uh, interested in trying to develop novel rational therapies, and we are lucky enough that this was supported uh, by a recent uh, advanced ERC grant. So in closing, and before leaving the floor, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of my precious collaborators over the year, in particular Jun Su, uh, Valérie, Valérie Lallemand, and also Julien Ablin, who is not here uh, on this image. I feel most privileged that I was able uh, to work with them for uh, a long period of time. I should say also stress the importance of academic freedom and in international collaboration, which has been a key feature of the APL saga and possibly one of the causes of its success. And apart uh, from this 20 plus uh, years collaboration uh, with Zhu Chen, uh, driven by respect and friendship, I'd like also to acknowledge the whole of APL community, uh, notably Ellen Solomon, Pier Giuseppe Pelici, and Pier Paolo Pandolfi. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my mentors as we all sit on the shoulders of giants. In Necker Hospital, during my medical training, I was taught that some patients could be viewed and modeled as biological systems that would be amendable to comprehensive pharmacology, and this was a major lesson for me. My colleagues in Pierre Thionnet's lab in, in the Pasteur Institute, uh, notably Anne de Jean, told me uh, the basis for molecular biology when it was still in, in, in its infancy. Most importantly, perhaps for me, Laurent de Gauss in Hôpital Saint-Louis, who first told me about APL and sh shared some of his provocative ideas on its putative physiopathology. I should also thank my home institutions, INSERM, CNRS, the Hôpital Saint-Louis, and now the Collège de France for their continuous support. François Jacob, uh, who was both in Pasteur and Collège de France, uh, usually said that important discoveries go through three sequential phases. First, they tell you it's not true. Then, it tr may be true, but it's not important. And the last killer is, uh, is true, important, but you did not discover it. Uh, I think we all experience some of this at different points of our lives. Fortunately, we have uh, our family, art, and patience. And I'd like to draw your attention to our lab meeting here uh, in uh, San Miniato del Monte in Florence, uh, because art and science are intimately linked. <coughs> and the intrinsic beauty of the APL model kept me inspired for almost 30 years. Finally, this morning I just arrived from China, and in the jet lag period, I was reading uh, the life of uh, Bengt uh, Schoenberg on the uh, website. I think he would have liked the APL story. As a child, he was a dreamer, he was an efficient entrepreneur. He thought that science should be, in, uh, should be driven by translation, inspired by patients, that drug repurposing was a very important approach, that he was uh, a bit skeptical about the superstructures of big pharma and thought that academic freedom uh, should uh, move, uh, move the head. I think uh, this story he would have liked. Thank you. <laughs>